So, okay, so welcome everyone to this course on memory technology and neuromorphic computing. So this is module one of the course where I would be just giving you an introduction to this field of memories. So first, let me tell you about the disclaimers. So I have made all the attempts to acknowledge the source of any material that I have used in preparing these slides and lectures. And it should be noted that you know the purpose of introducing them is purely academic. I do not intend any copyright violation or anything like that. But in case if there is any inadvertent copyright violation, please bring it to my notice so that I can rectify it. So now the do's and don'ts for the course. So the do's goes as follows. First is more of a request. So you are requested to join the meeting link five minutes before the scheduled time so that no time is wasted, you know, while waiting for the other students. And I can start the you know, lectures or discussion sessions sharp at 11. Also, one thing that I feel about questions is that, you know, uh, you should ask questions without thinking what others will think about you. According to me, or as far as what I think about questions, no question can ever be stupid. What can be stupid is the answer to that question. And that will come from my side, right? So, you know, who can be stupid? It can't be you. So let others think whatever they're thinking. But please feel free to ask questions. Don't feel like, you know, if you ask questions, people will feel something bad about you or something like that. No, feel free to ask questions in this course. Also, uh, it's very important to get to know your classmates. Why? Because, you know, advisors or instructors are not always approachable. So in case you know your peers, they may be, you know, the first contact with whom you can discuss your problems, your doubts that arise during, you know, uh, reading the lectures or, you know, while going through the course material. And that is actually helpful in many cases. And also some of you who are planning to form groups for copying, it will be helpful for you also. Now, in case of any problem, be it related to this course or any other course, or you're facing some psychological problem, something is wrong in your family or something like that, anything, any problem that you face, do not hesitate to mail, message or WhatsApp me. I would always, you know, consider genuine problems. I've been very considerate. And I'll make sure that attempts are made to resolve your issues. So before I get into the intricate details of neuromorphic computing or, you know, these memories, memory technology, let us look at some of the recent developments which have propelled the growth of this memory market and this alternate computing paradigm such as neuromorphic computing. So what are those recent developments? Let us go through that. So the first is emergence of this, you know, ecosystem of interconnected devices. So you can see here that there are a lot of devices, a plethora of these devices has emerged under the umbrella of this internet of things. So you have these smart devices, wearables, mobile phones, these smart home appliances, then you have these wireless sensor nodes, and you know, these smart cars. All of these systems are connected to the internet or the cloud as they say it. And in turn, they are interconnected as well, right? Because all of these are connected to the internet. So these are connected to each other also in some way. So this whole ecosystem of interconnected devices has emerged in this era of Internet of Things. And all these devices, which are connected to the cloud, they are known as cyber physical systems. So you may heard, hear this term, you know, that there is this cyber physical system. What are they? Nothing, but they're a system of all these devices, which are connected to the cloud. Each device connected to the cloud may be called a cyber physical system. Now, since you have all these systems connected to this cloud, even if an adversary or a malicious attacker gets access to one of them, he can actually potentially get access to the cloud and in turn the other devices as well. And that is the problem with these, you know, IOT systems. So they are all interconnected. And if somehow a malicious programmer or an attacker gets access to any one of them, it's a threat to the entire IOT ecosystem. And that is why nowadays, you know, people are paying more attention to these hardware security primitives. So instead of securing their cloud, what they're doing is they're instead, you know, embedding hardware security primitives in all of these smart devices so that they are resilient to these security vulnerabilities or attacks from the malicious programmer. And you may have heard that, you know, nowadays these hacking attacks or these adversary attacks have increased significantly. In the news, they are already there. Okay, so this is all about IoT. Now what IoT has led to is, first of all, you already have more than 25 billion devices connected to the internet and with each other by now. Also, if you look at the IoT economy, it's like 
dollar 7.1 trillion uh, do you guys have any idea about the gdp of india it's only 2.6 trillion dollars so this iot ecosystem generates an economy which is even larger than the entire gdp of our country you can understand what is the amount of you know market that this iot ecosystem has got also these interconnected devices communicate to the cloud and they communicate with each other as well right so there is a huge amount of data that is flowing throughout the universe right now between these iot devices and you can just imagine that it's around like every second 44 zettabytes of data as i speak now as i speak one single syllable or one word 44 zettabytes of data is being transmitted throughout the world and you know how much is 44 zettabytes in terms of gigabytes it's 44 trillion gigabytes so you can just imagine 44 trillion gigabytes of data per second is being generated by this iot ecosystem and it is flowing across the universe now what are the sources of this data so you know this huge data explosion that has emerged people call it big data so there is this asynchronous data which is flowing across the universe through all these sources and what are these sources sources include personalized healthcare so you get all sorts of data regarding you know your uh, blood report and so on and they are stored somewhere then travel data these traveling companies and all they also make their databases then education is one of the major sources of you know generating this data especially in this time of you know online education with covid telecom also generates a huge amount of data e-commerce companies like amazon uh, you know they generate huge amount of data and they have separate databases storing the information about the consumers or the customers and you know almost every one of us uses these e-commerce websites you can understand how much is the data that they may be generating and they also store the data regarding what consumers were looking for what is in their wish list what kind of searches they are doing and all these based on all these searches they do data mining and then give you recommendations over facebook or you know other uh, public platforms the media and entertainment including social media is one of the major generators of this asynchronous data retail enterprises and even the finance sector so this finance sector also has to keep a record of you know uh, let's say share prices every day what is the share price what's the trend uh, what was the trend 10 years ago so all these things are stored somewhere so you can just imagine that this huge amount of data has to be stored somewhere and it has to be processed as well for any meaningful operation so this asynchronous data has actually led to this data explosion or what we call as the big data and we need memory devices high density low cost memory devices to store this big data somewhere right so this is one of the things that has propelled the development of these memory devices and that has you know enhanced the uh, memory market a lot now apart from this there is another point but there is another thing which you should know nowadays we are living in an era of artificial intelligence revolution right so ai has got multiple applications and these applications have been rising significantly so you are also using ai in our day, like in your day to day life you are using you may be using you know this alexa siri or you know voice assistants like okay google also also you may be using these camera filters on snapchat or you know uh, there are there are many apps like face app which can tell you how you look when you grow old so you must be using all sorts of these apps without knowing that you are actually playing with ai systems so ai is now everywhere and emergence of this ai and the huge deal of applications that it promises has led to development of dedicated processors which can actually accelerate these ai applications so your conventional cpus or gpus as we shall see later in this course are not very you know energy efficient and area efficient while dealing with these ai applications and you know even when these when you talk about this alexa or snapchat you must like you may have observed that they work only when you're connected to the internet so what exactly happens is that all these applications they just record your voice and send it to the cloud for processing and then the cloud processes this data and sends it back so the output is sent back from the cloud to your mobile phone or your smart smart devices so it's something like this processing is not done still on your mobile phones processing of such ai application is done on the cloud and then the output is being sent to your mobile phone for display or you know for any other thing so right now the capability of these you know uh, traditional processors is not sufficient to handle this kind of artificial intelligence applications in an efficient way 
So this has also you know, propelled the development of memory-based computing systems, which are typically known as in-memory computing systems, which can handle such artificial intelligence applications very efficiently. And typical data, I mean, uh, the kind of circuits that we develop, they have like, you know, an energy efficiency, which is more than 10 power six, or which is like six orders of magnitude higher as compared to your traditional CPUs or GPUs. Still, it is inferior as compared to your human brain. So all these things will be covered in this course, how exactly it is inferior, why exactly it is inferior, and what can we do to achieve, you know, levels of efficiency of human brain. So those things will be covered in the later part of this course, but you just understand as of now that, you know, these developments in the field of IoT, big data and artificial intelligence has actually propelled the development of these memory devices. Or these have been the driving force behind the development of this memory market, as well as these memory devices, new memory devices. Also, there has been a shift in the paradigm, application paradigm. So earlier in 1990s or close to 2000s, or even late 2000s, it was a compute centric paradigm. So the servers, I mean, the main application of the servers was to solve some differential equation. And the bottleneck was, you know, the communication between CPU and memory. So earlier it was all the servers that you have, I mean, the Google server or the other servers that you may know of, they were being used for computing. But nowadays, what is happening is these servers are actually used for analyzing data. So I told that there is huge amount of data that is being generated by, you know, all these sources in this era of big data and all this big data has to be stored somewhere. So it is stored somewhere, typically in the servers. And then these servers are kind of mining this data. So they, they are now being used to analyze these data and the application has suddenly shifted from compute centric paradigm to a data centric paradigm where the bottleneck is storage that is you have to store this huge amount of storage, like huge amount of data. You have to analyze this huge amount of data. So that is the major bottleneck in this era now. And you know, you have all sorts of courses now emerging on data sciences, right? That is also because of these emerging applications. So here, if you observe carefully in this slide, I have mentioned memory and storage as two different entities. I mean, here I've mentioned memory, here I've mentioned storage. Are these two different entities or are these same? So that is the question that I'll be answering next. So, so far any doubts or any problems while understanding? Okay, in case there are no further doubts, let me go to the next slide. So here I'll be talking about memory organization in typical systems. So I don't know if any of you has opened your you know, laptops or your CPUs, uh, by opening, I don't mean opening by turning the power button, but I'm, I mean, have you opened it ever physically by unlocking those screws? So if you open it up, then you'll find that you see these kind of, you know, different PCBs, different ICs and so on. So here I have just pointed out where exactly you can find your memories. So your registers and SRAM are actually here in your motherboard, on your motherboard, embedded on your motherboard. You have these two slots where you, say that, okay, it's my RAM. So RAM is nothing but your DRAM. So the RAM that you look at your, you know, in any configuration of CPU or laptop, you look at the RAM first, right? That RAM is nothing but it's a DRAM. So you can, you may have heard about the names such as SD RAM, DDR3 RAM, DDR4 RAM. There are different kinds of DRAM, but inherently they're all DRAMs. And you have one or two slots for putting your DRAMs. Then you have this thing, which is called hard disk, right? So this is something that you may have already seen, but uh, registers and SRAMs, this is something which is on the motherboard and it is not visible. DRAMs also, you may have seen a DRAM chip, how it looks like. So it looks like a video game cassette. I mean, uh, there was this optical video game cassettes earlier. So it looks something like this. Anyway, so this is typically what you'll observe on your CPU or even when you open your laptop. So what exactly happens inside your, you know, the CPU or your laptops, the memory is actually organized in a hierarchical manner. So typically now you have multi-core processors, right? So you have core one, core two, dot, dot, core N. You have octa-core, hexa-core, all sorts of processors nowadays. So you have these cores, which are nothing but the processing engines of your CPUs. Now inside this core, you have these registers. So this blue here represents a register, which is 
the fu most fundamental memory unit. So inside the core, that is a processing engine, you have registers which are embedded. What are the properties of these registers? So their speed is very high. So you can get or fetch data from these registers pretty quick in just one CPU cycle, taking almost 0.1 nanoseconds. So you understand that the speed of these registers are pretty high, but if you look at their capacity, so what is the cap capacity of that register? So typically you will have 100 bytes of registers in your processing cores. So the memory capacity is pretty low. It's only some bytes, 100 bytes typically. Now, there is another parameter, which is your physical size. So physical size of your registers or layout of a register, if you do that, then it occupies a large area. So physical size is large, speed is large. However, its memory capacity is pretty low. Now let, let us go ahead to the next, uh, like next level of hierarchy in the memory organization, which is your cache memory. You may have heard about the word cache, that it's cache memory and so on. So what exactly is a cache memory? So let me first discuss what exactly is a cache memory. So cache memory is nothing but a combination of a content addressable memory and a SRAM or a static RAM. So uh, don't get scared. Let me just tell you what exactly cache memory does. So entire data of your system is actually stored in this main memory, which is nothing but your DRAM. So every time a program has to access any data, then it has to fetch this data from the main memory, bring it to the processing core, and then again, store the data back. I mean, store the output back to the main memory. This actually takes a lot of energy and it also produces a lot of delay. So instead what happens is these cache memories are placed inside the processing cores, which kind of generate a local copy of that data. So whatever data is there in the main memory, what this cache memory does is it creates a local copy of that data so that if we have to use that data again and again, the program doesn't have to go to the main memory to fetch that data again to the processor. It just can take the data from this copy of the data from this cache memory. So that is the main goal of cache memory. So we use cache memory just to produce local copies of the data stored in the main memory so that, you know, processing speed becomes faster. And nowadays the speed of the processor, as well as the cost of the processor is being dictated by this cache memory. So larger the size of the cache memory you have, larger the cost of your processor and higher the speed of your process. It's something like that. So before I get into the detail of how CAM array and SRAM array works, let me discuss about the different levels of cache. So cache memory also exists in a hierarchical manner. So you have different L1. So first level of cache is L1 cache. And in L1 cache, which is also embedded in the core, that is a processing engine, you have two sets of cache memories. One is your instruction cache, L1 instruction cache. And second is your L1 data cache. So typically in a computer, what happens whenever a program is fed into a computer, it first fetches the memory for the address of the instruction that it has to perform. And then it looks for the address of where the operands are on which it has to perform that instruction. So essentially each program has got two important parts, which is the instruction part and the data part instruction, which tells the computer what needs to be done and data, which tells the computer on what thing it has to be done. Information about all of them is stored in the main memory. So to create local copies of the instruction and data cache, which can be used again and again, or which are potentially, uh, you know, which computer knows that it can potentially be used again and again, it just generates a local copy of that in L1 instruction cache and L1 data cache. Now, the other, the higher level of this cache or the next level of this cache is called L2 cache. And this L2 cache is also, so these cache are made up of CAM array and SRAM. This is true for L1 cache and L2 cache. And the cache memory, the speed is like the time that it takes to fetch data from cache memory is almost one to 10 nanosecond. And the amount of CPU cycles is 10 to 100 CPU cycles. However, their size, although larger than register, that is the memory capacity, although larger than the register, it is still of the order of some kilobytes. So your cache memory, can only store some kilobytes of data. And their physical size, as I told that registers are quite large physically, cache memory is smaller in size, physical size than your registers, but still it's very large. 
So again, after L2 cache, we have level three of cache, which doesn't use SRAM array. So level three cache actually uses embedded DRAMs. So I'll discuss what, what exactly is embedded DRAM, how exactly it's faster than the conventional DRAM and so on. But in L3 cache, what they typically use is an embedded DRAM and not a SRAM. So this system comprising of your core, your uh, you know uh, registers, L1 cache, L2 cache, and L3 cache, these are embedded on your motherboard. So these memory elements are called onboard or on-chip memory or onboard memory. Apart from this, all the other memory elements are off-chip because they are not on your motherboard, which is the main processing engine. Okay, so now with this introduction to cache memory, let me tell you how exactly cache improves the speed of your processor. So I told that, you know, whatever is the data that a program has to fetch from the main memory, a copy of that is stored in your L1 cache, L2 cache, and L3 cache. So what exactly happens is, first the program tells you the address where this, in, where this data is, is in the main memory. So that address is actually fed into this CAM array or content addressable memory. So let's say there are several of these data bits, one, two, three, four. So the address of these data bits in the main memory is actually fed in this CAM array. So CAM array is nothing but an array of addresses, addresses corresponding to each of these data bits. And these addresses are stored in this content addressable memory and the corresponding data value that is being stored in this SRAM array. So let's say a program wanted to access the first bit here, first data bit here. So what the computer will do, it will first give that, take this address, store it in the CAM array and the corresponding value, it will store in this SRAM array. Similarly, if the program wants to also access the next data bit, it will store the address, the computer will store the address in the CAM array of the cache and it, it will store the corresponding bit value in the SRAM array of the cache. Now, once the CAM array and SRAM arrays are populated with local copies of the data present on the main memory, what exactly happens is when the program is again called, let's say the same program is called again, then what happens? It just gives the address which it was looking for. I mean, the address of the data bit that it was looking for, that address is given as query to this CAM array. So this content addressable memory, it takes that address of the data as a query and it looks whether that data is present, whether that address is present in this table or not, in this array or not. If the query address is present in this CAM array, then we say a hit has been there or a cache hit is there. So if this address is present in the CAM array, that is the data which the program wants to access is present in your cache, then we say that it's a cache hit and immediately that data is accessed from the SRAM. So you don't have to go to the main memory and access the data back. It is accessed directly from the local copy. However, if the program you know, sends the address to this cache memory and that address is not present here, that is it's a cache miss, then what happens? That value is again, the main memory is accessed and its address and the data bit are stored in the CAM array. So the cache is updated. So typically the cache is flushed and updated having like uh, with different schemes. The most common scheme is first in first out, by which the cache data is populated and it is flushed. So uh, any problem regarding cache memories? I mean, any uh, doubts regarding cache memories? Sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, sir, what is the function of, I mean, L1, L2 and L3, why three different stages? Okay, so three different stages because, you know, uh, so typically what happens is some programs may access data frequently. Some may not access the data much frequently. So corresponding to like considering those things into account, they have actually divided the cache memory into different levels. L1 cache, which is fastest, but its capacity is smallest. L2 cache, which is, you know, moderate in terms of speed, but its capacity is also moderate. Then we have this L3 cache, which is slower in speed as compared to L1 and L2 cache, but its density is high as compared to L2 cache and L1 cache. This is based on you know the programs which may access the data more frequently are placed in L1 cache uh, with less frequency of uh, like accessing they are placed in L2 cache and ones which are you know sparsely or I would say less frequently even less frequently accessed as compared to L2 cache they are placed in L3 cache so it's program dependent. 
ओके सर थैंक यू सर बट लाइक इट डिपेंड्स ऑन द यूजर नो लाइक इफ समाइम्स इफ ही यूजेस वन एप लाइक मल्टीपल टाइम्स बट आफ्टर वन और टू मंथ्स इफ ही ट्राइज इफ ही अवॉइड्स दैट एप सो देन दैट इट विल अपडेट ऑटोमेटिकली दैट देन इट विल अपडेट सो इफ फॉर टू मंथ्स ही हैज नॉट बीन यूजिंग दैट एप देन दैट डेटा विल बी डेफिनेटली फ्लश्ड अवे फ्रॉम द स्कैप और कैश अवे ओके सो देन इट विल बी इन लाइक फ्रॉम L1 टू L2 It will yeah, change. so it, it, will it can also done. transfer this data from L1 to L2 and then L2 to L3 and then it can flush it out. That okay. is also one of the scheme. But these schemes are basically done at the architectural level. Okay, sir. So what is the advantage of having DRAM with L3 instead of SRAM? So typically, what happens? SRAM, the size of one SRAM cell is pretty large. It's six transistors. But with DRAM, the size of one, like the size of one cell, one DRAM cell is only one transistor, one capacitor. So it's typically one transistor only. so that way the density can be improved without taking much area so whenever you talk about memory you talk about three different aspects one is the speed how fast you can fetch data from that memory second you talk about you know what is its memory capacity what is the density how many such cells can you pack in a particular area that depends upon its its physical size and in terms of physical size your sram has got a large physical size as compared to dram and that is the reason to accommodate more number of bits in a smaller area because this motherboard is typically a small chip right so to accommodate that within a smaller area you basically use edram which is embedded dram and the third aspect of memory that you look for is the cost sram is the most costly element i mean cache memory is the most costly element most costly memory element registers are even costlier than that but srams are costlier drams are typically cheaper than that and as you go towards the higher hierarchical levels such as you know uh, your main memory that is your dram your tertiary memory that is your magnetic disk or your secondary storage that is your flash or hard disk so your cost essentially reduces cost per bit reduces so dram also constitutes a large cost of your processor ssds typically they are also costly but these are ssds are basically between your main memory and your secondary storage hard disks are cheaper and these tertiary storage disks like magnetic tapes they are even cheaper so three aspects of memory very which are very important one is your speed second is your cost per bit and third is your physical size or your memory density which like physical size dictates your memory density so is that point clear why exactly we go for dram instead of sram we want to accommodate a large density in a reasonable space and at a reasonable cost industries are already like industries are always driven by the cost not by anything else they want low cost per bit that's all at an appreciable speed okay so yeah please go ahead uh, so why uh, embedded is used with drams like uh, okay so embedded dram is even faster than your uh, main uh, like uh, main main memory which is your conventional dram so embedded dram is a separate process okay yeah so it's faster and it's so close to the processor you want faster memories right yes that's yes. why you have a flavor of this memory which is faster than your conventional memory okay yeah that is why i told that e dram is different from the conventional dram and i'll discuss about it when i will talk about drams okay so okay, okay. And, and sir uh, in this uh, the cam array like mm -hmm. it is written in the below drive input drive like tag so tag is basically the address which we are uh, which we want to uh, store yeah this is coming from the input i mean this is coming from you know uh, the program so program sends an address to the main memory the same yeah. address is sent to the camera as well and the data is like now fetched and this data is actually sent through this input drivers to the sram yes sir yeah okay so the address so when you are uh, like this that was for storage time now when sir once you are you know accessing the program again again that address will be generated and that address will be sent here okay yes sir. as a query yes yes and then it is a hit Yes, then it sir. goes to the sram and it kind of you know fetches that data and sends it to this core uh, core yes, or process yeah. yes okay thank you thank you so any other query regarding this cache memory yes. okay. so sir uh, in a nutshell the process is say my uh, processor needs some instruction in the register so it will uh, look in the first first uh, uh, level 1 cache if it is not present it will look to level 2 cache if yes. it is not present it will look to level 3 cache if yes. it is not present it will look to dram Then it will import import to L one via L three and L two, and it will store the uh, 
uh, I think a set of instructions sure. which are uh, uh, in the nearby addresses in the caches accordingly. Exactly. Is it the overall process? Yes. This is how it how it's done in summary. Yeah. Okay. okay. So after this cache, let us talk about this main memory, which is nothing but your DRAM. So your DRAM capacity nowadays it's it starts from 8 GB, right? So you have 8 GB of RAM, you have 16 GB of RAM, it goes to 32 GB for the conventional, you know, traditional processors. So main memory is the next level of hierarchy. It's off chip memory because you know it's a separate chip here, right? Before this, everything is on chip memory. DRAM is your off-chip memory. Its speed is slower as compared to your cache memory. It, the typical fetching time, data fetching time is 10 to 100 nanosecond. And it takes more than 100 CPU cycles to fetch a you know, instruction or a data from this main memory. And its size is typically some gigabytes. The basic element or the basic cell which stores this information in uh, DRAM is a one transistor, one capacitor cell. So it's called 1T1C. Nowadays, there are different flavors of this DRAM as well. You have like only capacitorless DRAMs. I mean, where this capacitor is not there. It's a one transistor DRAM itself. And typically this capacitor is a stray capacitor or a parasitic capacitor, even in the main memory. But nowadays people have come up with capacitorless DRAMs where this physical capacitance is not there. They are storing this data in the form of charges within the device. Field. So that is also something that we'll be discussing in this course. So the even higher level of this storage is this flash memory or the you know hard disk. So here the density is typically in terabytes, typical of your hard disks. However, the storage time or you know the time to fetch the data is typically some milliseconds. So it's very slow. Till so what happens is in your computer, if the hard disk is there, if your main memory is there, and all these memories are present, these all are updated together. So these are updated together and they are hence called online storage because hard disk content is also updated along with main memory and so on. So till this point, everything is called online storage. Beyond this, you have removable tertiary storage or disks where you just store the data from main memory or this hard disk and then you keep it somewhere else. So this is called offline storage. So here you understand that this is on-chip memory. First classification, on-chip memory. What are on-chip memories? Your registers, cache memories are on-chip memories. Then this DRAM is off-chip memory. Secondary storage is off-chip. This is also off-chip. Now till this hard disk, which is updated whenever you are operating the CPU, it's called online storage. And beyond this, the tertiary storage is called offline storage. So this is the typical memory organization in your systems. Uh, now, I guess let us end this lecture over here itself because you'll have another class from, uh, you know, like 12. So we'll be talking